So this is a talk on the power of stories from Eden to Utopia. Here are some ideas that go beyond what I present in my book, How to Live the Good Life, a user's guide for modern humans. And I expected to have a copy here to hold to you, hold up to you so you could see it. But uh, unfortunately, I got diverted and didn't bring one with me. Although I do have copies available if you're interested in seeing them. Let me start by focusing on Christian, Jewish, Muslim stories. These stories have memes, that is ideas, that influence human behavior. These memes are central to how their adherents and others influenced by them think about social behavior, particularly communal behavior. These are religious stories that have much of importance in them about moral behavior and feeling that life has meaning that is maintaining a society over time. And of course for human beings the most important thing is to maintain their society over time even though most of us don't give any thought to it. But of course if the society isn't maintained it's no longer here. However, within their core, that is of, of the three religions I mentioned, lies in what I think is an unrecognized effect that focuses our attention in a dangerous way, in my opinion. And I'll explain that more as I go along. Most people in the USA are familiar with the Jewish stories of Adam and Eve and their being expelled from Eden, that is paradise, for breaking God's command to not eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. Some people take this to mean that human beings are innately bad or at least can't be trusted to do the right thing. These ideas of a punishing God deeply affect some people and lead them to accept punishment as the right way to handle bad behavior. And so it's okay to use physical punishment for children, wife beating, tough on crime, prisons, etc. I want to focus on this issue and suggest that anyone would be served by exploring how these ideas influence their everyday behavior and prevent them from considering that there might be better ways to deal with asocial, antisocial behavior. Here in hereafter written as cap A slash cap A behavior. Since I have a lot of those, I try to cut down some space. For example, it is widely accepted that, that any ideas about utopia are fantasy thinking. I believe a key reason for this is because a substantial number of our citizens accept the idea that people are innately bad, or at least some people are, and therefore a utopia is not possible and even more subtly the society bears no responsibility for the asocial antisocial behavior of its citizens. George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World focus on what might happen if science gave us the key to understanding deeper understanding the human brain. That's because people because some people seek power over others and would use this knowledge, that is the knowledge science would give them, to control societies in a totalitarian way. So instead of using this information to create a utopia, they would use it to create a dystopia, an anti-utopia, a society that is undesirable or frightening. As humanist community of Silicon Valley member Dr. Masuma detailed for us in her recent forum, Science Through the Power of Arts and Storytelling, science itself provides us stories about the things important to human beings. The birth of the universe, origin of humanity, the stars, etc. I would like to build on one element of that story when humanity evolved symbolic language. So rather than drawing from Adam and Eve, I would like to propose a different approach and move this discussion from the realm of spirit causality, that is the supernatural, to the realm of material 
causality, that is science. My suggestion is that when we judge behavior, instead of only focusing on what was done, we also focus on the specifics of why the thing was done. That is, working with cause and effect. For example, if someone tells a lie, the why would involve steadying the beliefs and the environmental influences that led the person to act as they did. This, this forces us to see the individual as a product of their society and how their asocial, antisocial behavior comes out of their own pain and ignorance. When sources, sources permit, this effort might look a lot like psychoanalysis. Did they lie because they saw it as a matter of life and death? Or was it merely to provide more spending money or one of the other hundreds of possible reasons? The biggest difficulty of current thinking starts with the assumption that human beings are fundamentally bad. That is, they didn't follow God's commands. That proves they're bad. And can only be saved by divine, that is, supernatural agency. And that punishment is the best way to deal with bad behavior. And evidences of that, when they were expelled from Eden by God, when God had Noah build an ark to save the few good people that were there. Once that assumption is accepted by a society, that society is hampered on how it can deal with antisocial, asocial behavior. Though human beings are innately social animals, we need to recognize at the same time that some individuals, due to their particular genetics and experiences, don't automatically recognize their social needs. I call them the conscience challenged. That is, the small part of a population, some of whom can become what have been called psychopaths, who don't have a deep inner voice telling them what is right, honest, and compassionate. These individuals, in the absence of necessary support, often seek to take advantage of others and usually don't recognize why this is a mistake. Unfortunately, the stories about good and, e and evil provide a model that supports these individuals' behavior. That is, the stories teach that people are innately bad, so they can believe that they are just doing what they have been taught all people want to do. Our stories over and over stress punishment as the obvious solution. Unfortunately, when the conscience challenged are apprehended and punished, they don't follow society's idea slash thinking, that is expectation, to just stop the bad behavior and do the right thing. They follow a different rule. Win the confrontation, whatever the price, especially in a hostile environment. And winning becomes the focus of their lives. And a good reference for this information is the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Center. And we can talk more about that later. So the conscience challenged often take guidance from the stories that people are innately bad. They accept that, therefore, they think what they are doing is just what everyone wants to do. They tend to be good actors and are able to take advantage of others who don't actually believe that everyone is innately bad, since they aren't. Could be you. And since we haven't developed tools and procedures to get enough into their thinking of, thinking of the conscience challenge, to find out, why, find out why they actually are doing what they are doing, they live their lives unable to recognize the error of their ways. Since our leaders generally are conscience challenged, let me say that again, since our leaders generally are conscience challenged, they lack the motivation to explore whether or not punishment is the best way to change behavior in a positive direction. And they see their own asocial, antisocial behavior as necessary in running the society. Therefore, what they are doing is laudatory. It is my belief that our species has genes that produce a small percentage of individuals who are conscience challenged. This has come about because this attribute, though problematic, has an importance to the long-term survival of a tribe. 
In difficult times, the tribe can benefit by having someone who can ignore normal behavior and do things that, would, that others would not think of doing and thereby get the tribe through a difficult situation. But letting them rule without oversight in normal times can be counterproductive. In a violent society like the United States, many of the conscience challenged will become so-called psychopaths. See the book Psychopath Whisperer, The Science of Those Without Conscience, written by Kent A. Keel. In a loving society like the Polynesians, probably almost none would become psychopaths. Because they have not been taught that people are innately bad, they are able to learn by example and see the room for themselves of what works best for everyone, including themselves. And in normal times, that is not by lying, stealing, cruel behavior, etc. Almost all the stories in the USA we see on television, read in newspapers, novels, etc., take for granted that at least some people are innately bad and that punishment is the answer to dealing with antisocial, asocial behavior. Our stories lead us to believe that asocial and antisocial behavior is part of essentially everyone's innate nature, and without punishment, essentially everyone would be a thief, liar, bully, etc. We are taught that essentially none would be good without punishment or the threat of punishment. And yet even in the USA, essentially the whole population, even without relevant teaching, are good citizens. So if you ask, why would anyone believe that they would benefit from lying, stealing, abusing others, etc., I think that takes us back to how societies develop. The conscience challenged, who lack the innate feeling of compassion, tend to become the leaders and provide models of behavior. However, I believe change is possible as more and more people discard the belief that individuals are innately bad. This will allow us to see that most people are in fact socially responsible. Less than 1% of the total population in the USA is in jail or prison, even though they are taught people are innately bad. In addition, the foregoing allows us to recognize that we all can learn to be socially responsible. This can happen because we all can observe which behaviors work best for us in our society given time and support. But it does help us to have stories that clarify why a person actually did what they did and fewer stories that only focus on what was done and leaves us feeling good when justice triumphs and the miscreant is punished. Hopefully the foregoing might lead more and more individuals to recognize that any asocial, antisocial act comes out of the individual's ignorance or pain, which of course is only a different way of saying the same thing. So if a society fails to teach compassion, it shares the blame with the individual for the asocial, antisocial acts of its citizens. It is my belief that the mass incarceration in recent decades were actually done for racist reasons but under the cover of our widespread belief that punishment changes behavior in a desirable way. Basically, anyone raised in the USA would think it absurd to doubt that doing a bad act would not benefit the doer. They think they are good because they don't want to be punished. They have been taught all their lives that people can benefit from being bad. And this comes naturally from the idea that people are innately bad. Part of this includes the belief that having stuff is an important source of pleasure. And I view this as needing steady and clarification. On the other side, the pleasant feeling aroused by being good, doing good, is often dismissed as naive, simple-minded, childish, provincial, etc and we are almost all vulnerable to such characterizations if done by individuals in power. 
The underlying problem is the fundamental assumption upon which the three religions I mentioned is based. The immediate problem is that almost all of our newspapers, magazines, novels, and visual media tell their stories in ways that ensure we won't look for the relevant facts. Plus, the widely held belief that searching to understand the underlying reasons someone did a bad thing would lead us to become bleeding hearts and pampering the guilty, and therefore is seen as a great danger to a society. Well, I, I haven't put all of you to sleep, but I see there's a, some people making good use of their time. Uh, if anybody would like to throw something in at this point, just to sort of uh, change the dynamics, uh, I'd be willing to take a few minutes to do that and, and see, and then I'll go on to, f to finish up. So if anybody has anything they would like to share with us at this time, <coughs> now is the opportunity. Actually, I, I have a question. Uh, so far, you've not distinguished between a psychopath and a sociopath. And those two things are different. A psychopath is born and a sociopath is made. Generally, uh, well, let me say this about that. What you're talking about is in the realm of theory. The, 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 the sociopaths and psychopaths are different in that socio psychopaths are, are, are scientists who believe in behaviorism. So, sociopaths are those who take the society more in, I, involved. If, if you read the book I suggested, that shows they all from a, soci a psychopathic dimension, in which psychopaths, there are 10 characteristics you have to fulfill to be a, a, a psychopath. And because they are born, they're very hard to cure, you know, because it, their brains are wired in a yeah. certain way. But what does it mean to have a wired brain? All of our brains are wired. See, what I'm trying to get to is to, we need to get into how brains actually work. We need to do the research. Instead of building an aircraft carrier, we do some research on how a brain works. That's my point. You can have a different point, and that's okay. You are a humanist, so you're obviously going to have a different point somewhere. Well, I can't argue with that statement. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> Anyone else? I agree with you generally, but as uh, Christy pointed out to you, there's supposed to be something like 10,000 religions, and oh. we've got over 7 billion people on the planet. And I agree with you in the humanists, but... Yeah, well, you don't have a mic, so you shouldn't be talking. <laughs> but the humanists are kind of a pimple. You don't have a mic, you shouldn't be talking. Sorry. Okay, I have a mic. Hey, there's a the man <laughs> with a mic. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, in, I, I like the dialogue here. It's interesting. It's uh, stimulating. But I'm, I'm wondering where you're going with this. <laughs> and uh, Sometimes I wonder that yeah, myself. Yeah, I just want to see how you're going to change up everything <laughs> uh, yeah. at all, when all said and done. Thank you. Well, good. I'm, I'm looking forward to your eager, your eager smile at the end. So what do you think about the theory that uh, you can tell somebody's got something wrong with their brain if they like to torture animals as children? Do you think that's something that they can be uh, persuaded is an unkind thing to do? With it? I didn't quite hear what you said about animals. Some children like to torture animals. Uh -huh. And uh, that's... The, the yeah. Well, let, let me say, the, the, those kinds of things, that gets to the core. What is going on? And, 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 and almost the bad seed, almost... The, the basic idea is the people are doing those things because whether it's something in their brain or whether it's in their finger or whatever, those things are causing them to be bad and that's just a given, so get used to it. And what I'm trying to say is we don't do enough study. I mean, certainly in the last 50 years, we've done a tremendous amount of study in this direction I'm trying to aim us. Yes. One more, and then we'll get back to <laughs> business as usual. 
Arthur, I agree in general with the thrust of uh, your talk, but I think it's overly pessimistic. I think that there's a difference between the actions that we see and what's happening and what people actually believe. For instance, the leaders that you say that our leaders generally are conscience challenged, they lack motivation to explore whether or not punishment's the best way to change behavior. I think that there's a positive direction in society that has existed for quite a while where the leaders are looking for ways to rehabilitate the criminals, ways to lessen the punishment, ways to make them more comfortable, ways to educate them and get them prepared for working in the outside world. So I think there is a movement for that, but there are practical limitations, monetary limitations, not knowing how to go about it, plus the fact that people who have led a life of uh, criminality have a difficult time changing the neural pathways and so its rehabilitation is very difficult but I think a lot of the leaders we have um, are looking in the right direction but there's practical uh, problems uh, and a, a point of clarification the Polynesians uh, uh, Margaret Mead was probably the first anthropologist who really uh, put out this idea of uh, coming of age in Samoa and so forth and how peaceful and loving the Polynesians were. But an Australian anthropologist who looked into this her work found that she was wrong. And the Polynesians uh, were not as peaceful and as loving um, as what they were made out to be by Margaret Mead. Yeah, well my point was, I don't, I think you'd have to look hard to find a Polynesian uh, psychopath. I'm not trying to, human beings do bad things for all kinds of good reasons, and I'm not trying to shine that off, but what I'm trying to say is, the society has more responsibility than we as U.S. citizens are willing to recognize and have been willing to recognize. And certainly what's happened in the prison system is off the wall, but again, I believe it happened for racist reasons. Why? Because Johnson got this equal rights thing or whatever, and blacks are supposed to be able to vote and all kinds of things, but we can't have that. And then some of them burn down stuff. Wow, that's a great, okay, now we know we're, what we've got. We've got the club. Now we're going to take those folks. And basically, this, this was a black-white thing. Not all, I mean, many whites suffered the same rules, but it, it really was a racist thing. And I don't have enough detailed information to go any deeper than that, but that's where I'm coming from. Okay, now back to where, where I... Uh, Left. Okay, I think I stopped here. The, the underlying problem is the fundamental assumption up, upon which the three religions I mentioned is based. The immediate problem is that almost all of our newspapers, magazines, novels, and visual media tell their stories in ways that ensure we won't look for the relevant facts. And of course, the issues that were brought up I'm saying underneath those things you're looking at and talking about and bringing up is what I'm dealing with. What's underneath? For, to get underneath that, you need science. You need study, which obviously means you need financial support. We don't give that realm very much financial support because we'd rather have aircraft carriers than a society without prisons. Not all of us, of course. The ones in this room, hopefully, are, are outside of the generalizations I'm throwing out. By focusing on what was done rather than why it was done, a much more difficult question to answer anyway, we prevent using humanist values to move things in a constructive direction. Instead, we maintain a costly model that harms us all and promotes self-indulgent leadership by the conscience challenge. The foregoing provides the current model of innate sinfulness held in check 
by fear of punishment that is moving toward the brink of disaster where our species is destroyed by global warming, overpopulation, and or nuclear slash biological Armageddon. Science has given us the power to do that. It's only when we get to humanism, or at least humanistic thinking, that we can question any society's core thinking. Are human beings fundamentally bad? Humanism would say no, we are fundamentally social beings. We have to be taught to be bad, or at least not taught how to avoid those behaviors. I think it is critical that we give up the belief that people are innately bad. In my opinion, that it, it is my opinion that individuals have been led astray for centuries. A key idea in Jewish, Christian, Muslim holy books is about punishment. And Christianity and Islam have moved into including a hell where a loving God will burn them, burn you forever. These books were written by the conscience challenged. Again, I'm presenting some assumptions. These are my assumptions. I'm not saying you can read a science report that will support these. I'm giving you what I, the conclusions I draw from having read a wide variety of, of sources and put, trying to make sense out of all of them. And, and, I, and I realize I haven't done a perfect job, and, and, but together we could do a better job because you will know a hell of a lot more than I know, that is, at least collectively, and maybe many of you individually. Okay, maybe I said this already. It is easy to understand why these ideas on asocial, antisocial behavior were adopted all those hundreds, even thousands of years ago. This simplified maintaining the tribe making it more manageable. I'm proposing an alternative that is only possible now using modern science and technological resources, which fortunately are becoming available to us. <coughs> it's clear to me that the best place to start is to develop testable hypotheses leading to useful theories. First, we recognize that good and evil do not exist outside the brains of human beings, and since they exist in our brains, we have the power to learn what is really going on. Another first step would be to recognize that human beings are social animals. They are not born good or bad. They learn their behavior from their interactions with the society in which they are raised, or are not taught and otherwise help to avoid an asocial, antisocial behavior. For, the, for me, this means studying asocial, antisocial behavior and learning why it happens. So a person who does asocial, antisocial things must be studied to learn why this A slash A things are being done. Punishment would never be involved except in the sense that change of human behavior is rarely easy and sometimes very difficult. And for some, this might look like punishment. Such a society would be committed to becoming a utopia, a place where every member is important. If any individual has mental quirks that lead to A slash A behavior, that would be seen as a gift to be studied and used to help the group better understand how brains work, while at the same time, of course, helping the individual as much as possible. When we focus on A slash A acts within the context that people are innately bad and require punishment, we can't ask why these acts were done, because that's already known. The things are done because the individual is innately bad and such behavior is to be expected. So labeling people bad ends up moving things in the wrong direction, toward punishment and almost never solving the problem. Since there is no motivation by the society to study and search for the actual reasons that these A slash A things happen, the society is stuck in a loop hampering its movement toward the light at the end of the tunnel where material causality is replaced by spiritual causality. Well, 
I'm sorry, where material causality replaces spirit causality. Got me there. The societies under discussion have been in that loop for many hundreds of years, even thousands of years. And this has taken humanity to a place where we might end our species. And my guess is we got to this place because conscience challenged leaders have provided propaganda, so we miss the real reasons why individuals do what they do. Introducing good and evil has allowed them to call the shots and manipulate the society so we won't make the changes that would turn everything around to produce a society where everyone is involved in establishing the rules and all win and we could all live in a community of trust and fairness. This is what I call a utopia. And since human beings are not born good or bad, but are born as social animals, we all need each other. Unfortunately, some members have difficulty recognizing that fact. Although an individual is totally responsible for everything they do or fail to do, this shouldn't lead to punishment, but to education. And education at its core is the society's responsibility. Currently, society's stories about A slash A behavior automatically focus on the wrong place since they omit society's role in the member's behavior. When we ignore society's responsibility in a citizen's misbehavior, we are critically misled since that missing component is an essential part of the real story necessary for finding solutions to prevent such behavior. So studying what a society is teaching and is what, and what is not being taught is essential because both influence everything else. For me, it's clear that we must examine the social environment the society is providing as well as what individuals are doing in order for us to get beyond the what and get to the why of bad behavior. In my approach, the bottom line would be what would the society need to do so that antisocial, asocial behavior wouldn't happen in the future? Here would be where the, the tools and processes of science would be used to gather and utilize information to explore changing the society so it would become a place where every person would be able to use their time and energy to make, it, make life better for everyone and experience the joy of satisfying challenging behavior, such as improving society even if only in some small way, including satisfaction in a job well done, or behaviors beyond anything I can presently imagine. I define this as creating a utopia. The development of science has given humanity a power it's never had before, with both positive and negative possibilities. Positively used, it could help us create a utopia. Used negatively, it can now actually wipe out our species along with most other species. More specifically, on the positive side would be exploring effective ways to create a utopia where life is worth living. That is a place where our differences are used to produce a place where everyone joyfully works together for the good of all. Since humanity lives in a cause and effect universe based on material causality, ruled by chaos theory, whenever we ignore the actual causes for behavior, we are stymied in truly understanding what's happening and thereby be able to prevent such behavior. My proposal requires that we understand humanism and what science and religion really are. My position is that humanism includes understanding humanity at the deepest level and that science is the search for congruency and religion is the search for meaning. We need a new story where human beings are recognized as perfectible, where building a utopia is not, is seen as possible. And there it is. Now let, you, let the audience begin. Mike is coming.
Well, I certainly agree with what Ta you're talking saying. to the mic. I, I agree with what you say in the humanist position, but with 10,000 religions, something like over 7 billion people, the humanist is great, but it's just like a little pimple on a cow. And I, I, I think that you are overly optimistic. Of course, I'm a born pessimist, but I don't think it's possible. We are genetically formed, and you would have to have all kinds of mutations to make us follow your rules. So, but have at it. <laughs> I don't have the hopes that you have. Thanks, anyway. Well, let me say, I, I started all this, all this out when I was a young college student and had great hope for humanity. And at that time, I would say all of this had a possibility of happening. That was when there was two or three billion human beings on the face of this earth. Now that we moved to seven or eight billion, I'll have to admit there's more, more pessimism in some parts of my thinking than maybe come across in my talk. But on the other hand, I don't see anywhere else to, to, to go. And I, and I think that, see, see where my thinking comes from, I, I, I think of astronomy and astrology. Now, if you think of astrology, you know what astrologers' ideas were about why there were stars and planets in the sky. They were to gate individuals and in figuring out how to live their life. And that could go on for tens of thousands of years, and they would probably develop some pretty good reasons why if the star is here or that planet's there, that's why you uh, robbed the bank or whatever. But then along came science, and with science came astronomy. And if we look at what astronomy is doing, it's, it, it's totally mind-boggling. How could us peddly human beings understand that much of the universe? It's really mind-blowing. And, and my fantasy is with, with modern technology and science, we have the tools where we truly could get in far enough into people's brains that where we would... We, we would be working for the person rather than against the person. And of course, most of the time, science in the prison system and, and all that range, even psychology, is working somewhat against the individual rather than really bringing them out and bringing them into things. It, it, and, and the reality is it's complex enough that it sort of overwhelms your brain. I mean, it's easy to think this can't be done. I mean, how in the hell could all this stuff be done? And maybe it can't. But I happen to live in a state of joy, and I want to put my energy into trying rather than saying it can't be done. So Arthur, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, I just wanted to point out that with regard to utopia, uh, it seems to me there's another factor involved here, and that is Murphy's Law. That if anything can go wrong, it will. And there's another factor and that is that uh, when people are uh, ha having their own thoughts, then especially with regard to meaning and what is it that is the right thing to do, there is a wide area of disagreement. And so that disagreement also, I think, uh, makes it difficult to, uh, to go for a utopia. However, I really agree with you about uh, the need to improve. And it seems to me that, that as I look at science itself, I see not a utopia, I see improvement. And so I see the improvement that, you know, is in, in science, the improvement is accelerated. And as I, it's been widely uh, described to be on an exponentially uh, increasing curve, okay? And obviously, I don't think we have caused that same curve to occur in the social sciences. And uh, 
and when, but I think you, you've, you've hit on something when you say, why on earth are these things happening? Okay, and you know, I live in uh, a majority black neighborhood in Washington, D.C., and so I see, you know, I, I can talk to people who know people uh, who are involved in crime of one sort or another, usually rather small level stuff, because they're just getting started. And so it's easier to see why is going on. There's enormous unemployment in that neighborhood. Okay? To my way of thinking, this is extremely important. Uh, in addition, we then take a look at what's happening with gangs. We see a lot of the time what they're doing is they're providing a family for the members of the gang. And I think that's an important element also. So I think these are all very important factors that are building in to some of the problems that we're seeing today. Uh, and however, with regard to this whole thing of innately bad in the brain, as I'm learning more about brain theory, because this is one of my hobbies, and I'm making some headway on it, um, it looks to me like there's an awful lot that when you are born, the main thing that is innately in there is an ability to learn how to do things. And that one of the, and to my way of thinking, an awful lot of the stuff that we're looking at, the chances are very good that a lot of the, what appears to be innate behavior may very well have been picked up possibly in the early years of life. And especially when we look at kids who are torturing animals. Um, uh, and I think uh, actually we, we have heard some research in the past that has suggested that there has been some uh, uh, early childhood influences there. Right. Well, th that's my, some of my thoughts. Well, thank you, Peter. And uh, I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with anything you say, and certainly as it comes to science, uh, science is not perfect. And as we've talked about in the past, uh, Bohr, who was involved in quantum mechanics as it exists, made the comment, science progresses at the death of one named scientist after another. And, and we all know we get stuck in our own brains and have difficulty getting out of it and seeing other things. So, so whatever's going to happen <laughs> is not going to be easy. But for my mind, to, to, to make something happen, you have to have a core of people working together to make it happen. And my fantasy is at some point there will be a core of people who are willing to go to the core of the matter and, and do that whatever they can and over time that will grow. My fear, however, I have to admit, is we've set up a situation where we may not even have a hundred years. Global warming has the potential to end the experiment, and I think it could happen within a hundred years. And what do we have? We have Yehu saying it, there is no such thing as global warming. So the challenge is out there, and maybe there's less cause for joy than I think. I think one of the reasons that religion is so successful is that it tells these fantasy stories that children love, Adam and Eve, miracles. I'd like to suggest to my own experience, I stumbled on the fact that young children love fantasy. You can create fantasy of humanist values and humanist stories, uh, and the kids just gobble it up, and they ask for more. So, you know, uh, I developed a story about uh, an Eskimo family that lived at the North Pole where it's very cold and they lived in a house made of snow and ice and there was a young boy there that they can identify with who, who did various humanist things, okay? Um, and they just gobbled it up and they asked for more and more. So, anyway, we have to create uh, humanist stories that appeal to young children uh, as the Bible and the story of creation and miracles does. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree totally with that. that it's, uh... I would like to point out that recent polls have indicated that more and more people cannot accept even Darwinism. Hopeless. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad something's supporting your pessimism there. You're not going to lose it easily. What a wet blanket. Hi, Arthur. I, I always find um, your talks interesting, and um, I, I guess the one thing that I didn't hear about uh, from you is that there's been a lot of studies recently now about belief, and you're talking about changing a belief. It's very challenging to do that. It's a natural human tendency to want to fight change. Uh, and, and the existentialists many years ago said they called it existential death. That is a huge group of people have to die to their ideas. And you were saying that unfortunately we can't wait until everyone that has those ideas dies. And so w one of the thoughts I had is maybe the direction, the more ideal direction, would be to go and fundamentally focus, which I think a number of folks are doing now, on the political realm and slow incremental changes. Uh, the only thing that I've ever noticed is that once changes like that are made, and I've seen them, they don't get adopted. Ones that work don't get adopted. And the reason is because of the system and the way it works now, where if you have a good idea, and they say, well, that's last year's idea, so we got to do something else. And on top of that, if there's one exception, which this is a probabilistic thing, right? It's not something that's going to be certain. Not everyone's going to respond to everything. One example, one counterexample is enough to kill the idea and think about how that works. You know, anyway, like I think, what was it? They started releasing more prisoners in Louisiana because they're the worst state in the union for prisons. They have the highest per capita incarceration in the world and in the United States. And one guy committed a crime that was released, and that, it, that did it, that almost killed it. Anyway. No, I, I, I agree with you. And, and at one level, we're all stuck in that. We are human beings after all. And, and we got here by going through some processes that maybe help us not get quite as much stuck in things, but we, we always have to be open to realizing just because we think it's true doesn't make it true. But, but more specifically, I mentioned the, the, the Mendota Juvenile uh, Treatment Center, which follows exactly what you said. Here, like 20 years ago, a, a few wise legislators say, how come our, our criminal justice system isn't working? I mean, we take people in, we keep them some period of time, we let them out, in a year or two, they're back. Now that's not what we're hoping for, we're hoping for a cure. And so they said, how about this? We, we take some of our worst juveniles and we put them into a situation where we're exploring alternatives. And so they set up the Mendota uh, uh, juvenile treatment center, which is part of the Mendota, uh, it's, a, it's a bigger health thing in Michigan and someplace back there. And, and they said, and you know in the 60s there was a lot of this thing, hey, don't punish your kids, talk to them, set up rules and enforce them. And that was pretty popular for a while. I don't know if it's still around. Some of us <laughs> lived during that time. We're still trying that approach. And it, and it certainly worked a hell of a lot better than the alternative. But, it, but, uh, but the point of it is, even though this, this treatment center, it, but it cost a lot of money to do this. And, and during the time of a little bit reduction of, of taxes, the legislator says, well, let's just eliminate this program. It's pretty expensive. But there was enough going for it that the legislators f fought well enough that it was only cut in half rather than being reduced. But, but, but the point is, here's a program that the research, because they did research on this to see what would happen. And, and that's where I get to the, to, the, to the point where we assume punishment works where what the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Center proved is that tr punishment is exactly the wrong answer for these kids. Because for these kids, when you punish them, 
you give them a challenge. Okay, you hurt me? What, how can I hurt you? And they're willing to meditate on that as long as necessary and will come up with the worst thing they can think to do. So, the, so these are real things. Now, I'm, I'm, ex <laughs> I'm extending that to the whole world, and obviously that's a dangerous thing to do, but at least we need to look at things differently to avoid trying to figure out how to not fall in the trap that, that you point out, which we do over and over. Somebody, I think, had the mic. Uh, hi, Arthur. Thank you. Um, Only one question, though. At a time. At a time, right, yeah. We can talk later. Uh, I tend to agree with you that um, I think you're right on. People aren't born bad or good. And I agree with the other point that you brought out later, that people have to be taught bad, although you're admitting by implication, although you don't sta state it, people need to be taught to be good, okay? So exactly. we're both on the same page there, I think. Um, as far as, and, and the other thing I would add that I don't see mentioned is people really uh, operate or motivated by their own self-interest, which is modified by how they are taught to be good or bad. And that's where the religions come in. But their own self-interest is themselves, their family, and then larger groups, including their religions. So um, religions tend to exclude other people. You know, this religion, you know, or that one, uh, you know, you're not chosen, or you're not Christian, you're going to go to hell, and all of that business. So your thoughts? Yeah. The, 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 we all have innate human emotions, and one of that is us-them. And we all have the us-them. It's a matter, but, but the us and the them is not defined in our brains. We have, the, we have the, the propensity in our brains, but what is what, what is us and what is them is not defined. And if you're raised in a liberal family with a lot of whatevers, uh, and, and you're in contact with a lot of different people, the us can be all of them. But uh, I, I've shared with you before my own experience with that being raised in a family which was pretty, I mean, not, not high level, but basically accepting people. And, and I certainly, and this was the times when, when uh, equal rights and all that kind of stuff was, was more being explored. And I, was, and, and I was convinced that I didn't have any prejudices. I was above that. I had transcended that. And then, as I shared before, I read this article in a newspaper where this black person was elected president of their group, a mixed group. And I shook my head and said, how is that possible? And a couple of minutes later, I said, okay, so I thought I was over prejudice, but that shit is in there, and it doesn't come out just by a lot of easy thinking. And that's where Peter, who's actually been more involved in a real situation, is, has, is moving in the right direction. And uh, next. Um, okay. Um, I'd say I have a suggestion, or I would say a prediction, but before I say it, I would want to imply first that I think that utopia would, uh, it's a mirage, like, it's something that when, when you get to a certain state you think it's perfect, then you, you'll see something better ahead. So it's not something that we could reach, but I feel like it's a good idea to have it as an objective so where you know you're, you're going towards a better society. So my suggestion slash prediction on how we can get closer to that, you know, it would be technology because that has, for the most part, been 
what has cured so much of you know the global problems and that's in the capacity of BCIs. BCIs are like uh, brain computer interfaces. I feel like eventually because of robotics and automation like human beings will find it difficult to be able to uh, cope with the high advancement of, of technology and our brains are not naturally equipped to to handle that much data and to cope. So eventually we're going to have BCIs. We're going to have interfaces in our brains that are going to somehow uh, try to help, if not eventually replace the whole you know, ability of what the brain can do. And that's still going to influence behavior. So I feel like that is kind of dicey because it would depend on whoever is developing that technology. Yeah. And so whatever their intent is for the most part will be what will play into how people will behave eventually. Because I feel like that's how society is going to yeah. challenge. Yeah. And, and if you start with the answer, you're in trouble. So you have to, you have to be starting with an open process and not thinking you can define the end because here we are in if not total ignorance, but a heck of a lot of it, and, and realizing we have to deal with stuff as it happens. And, uh, yeah, no question. You, you have to stay open, and, and staying open is not easy. Uh, there's, a challenge, there's a challenge that at some point to say, okay, I know it all, so no sense of paying attention to these other people or whatever. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments or suggestions. One for Herman, uh, to give us a publication date for this uh, children's story that he's already thought out. Uh, and, uh, you know, somebody's got to make some more uh, bold beginnings here. Uh, well, could, could, I, could I just, just say, you know, Senna sh shared with us a book that she picked up at the AHA conference that, where that is being done. And maybe at some point she would want to share that, but later. Okay, just don't discourage Herman. I want to hear about how this Eskimo kid turns out. Uh oh. <laughs> and the other is just a suggestion about this whole uh, um, notion of uh, the, the others and the in group uh, uh, unconscious bias. Uh, the Haas Institute at UC Berkeley. Uh, is a fantastic institution with some incredible leadership that um, is really working uh, at, at a really deep level uh, on those issues. Uh, they have some uh, good accessible publications. They have regular conferences. It's a short train ride or BART ride uh, to uh, get over there. I strongly encourage you to uh, see what they're doing. It's the Haas Institute at Berkeley, HAAS. Maybe someday you'll give us a talk on it. I was hoping you'd be there sitting next to me. <laughs> um, I, I would like to hear from you if you have any idea or what your suggestions are on how to deal with the consciousness challenged. No. And I'm not uh, with the consciousness challenged. How to, how you say, uh, help them cooperate instead of uh, going against what, you know, the good for all, which is what we strive for. Are you thinking of a specific group or no, just I am, in general? I, I am thinking in general because when I try to do that, I end up using the same methods that they use and, and then I enter this dissonance that I don't like and I haven't found any other way to do it where where and, and I'm not talking bad behavior that's not right because that one is explainable like you said it has causes da, 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 da. we all know what's behind that but I'm it's when you know that there might be a possibility that, that you're dealing with the 1% that really won't get it. But I don't want to also feel that I am above. That's not the way I want to do it. So 
And then the only thing that I see, like, okay, I'll study, I'll know how they thought, what their thought processes are. And then when I vow to act, then and I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing the same thing. I don't want that. So I don't know if you have any suggestions or either how to get over that, you know, for, because for me it becomes a moral thing. Uh, or, and say like, yes, I'm doing this, but then I am a both. So it's, it's, yeah. well, it's weird. Well, 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 let me share you with, with experience. My, my lady friend, Joan, uh, Joan Bogato, was taught kindergarten. And in the process of going through the whole thing, she got into the, the 60s models of the kind of thing I'm talking about. And, and, and the basic idea is, uh, okay, when the, when the kid says, I don't like you, go to hell, and you say, go to the principal's office, you've, you've, lost, you've lost the argument. They win. And so she explored other alternatives, like, uh, okay, I, I know you're feeling angry at me at this time, and they were using words that not only we don't use in kindergarten, we usually don't even use it in the humanist community. And so she said, okay, I know you're feeling angry with me at the time. Uh, I, I need you to go over and sit in the, the chair where we are reserved for people like that. And when you're ready, come back to the group. No punishment, don't write a thousand times, I will never say this again, all that kind of baloney. And she found that a very effective way in that situation. But see, that's the whole thing. Every situation is different, and how do we, how do we pull it off? And that's, to my mind, why we need others around us that can remind us of uh, maybe a, 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 a different way of doing it, or, how, or what, it, what to do when this happens. Because the kid did go sit in the chair, he did come back and join the group, you know, so obviously that's the ideal record, you know, okay, we've got, well, got a success here. And they don't always turn out as successes, as we all know who have been around. <laughs>